Welcome everybody hey. to the Poets Tree. I, I take your shoes off and let your toes sink down to the roof. <laughs> all are welcome here, poets, songwriters, lovers of all worlds. If you feel it, pick up what we're putting down. Come on! Now, what, 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 what? I pad, I poet, I paradox, you know it. I got Wi-Fi fingers on my wisdom's uploaded. Now, what, 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 what? Why are you playing hard to get with the infinite? Now, what, 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 what? I'm calling forth every outsider, outcast, and outlier. Welcome, welcome, welcome home to the Poets Tree. Thank you so much for being here with us at the Old Globe. My name is Gil Sotu. I am your host for this show. Um, it's a labor of love. Really, to be honest with you, it's uh, an excuse that, for me to get out of dealing with toddler logic for an hour. Uh, bless my wife. So instead, I come here with you and get in deep with the poetry. So the Poets Tree is an interactive uh, show where we, we talk about poetic devices, poetic tools, things to really help your performance grow. And you get to learn from some of the best poets around the world. So my pleasure is to introduce you to some of the hottest poets doing it today. And uh, today is no exception. So let me introduce our guest for this afternoon. Mr. Paul Maybon is a poet and an actor from Chicago, Illinois. Since the early 90s, Paul has been performing poetry locally and professionally on television shows such as It's Showtime at the Apollo and HBO's Deaf Poetry Jam and TV One's Verses in Flow. His television credits, and every time I see him on TV, I pause it, take a screenshot, share it with my friends, because I'm just so excited I get to see him on TV on some of my favorite shows like Insecure or Superstore, or Criminal Minds, or Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Currently, Paul plays the character Alan on the pro progressive commercials, progressive insurance commercial franchise, and can be seen in the Harrison Ford movie, Call of the Wild. And more so than all of that, this is the dude that I call on when I need that dude. When, when things are, all hell is breaking loose and I just need somebody to talk some sense into me, even though he talks utter nonsense all the time. I call this dude a uh, good, good friend of mine. Please give your emoji claps, snaps, whatever you need to for my friend, Paul Maybon. <laughs> hey. What's up, just, Paul? I was just about to say, why did you call me? I don't know why you called me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I only get the best of the best. It's only a bonus that you're my friend, but like, <laughs> I-, you, uh, I when you get about to do something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. true, that's true. <laughs> you, you, you have talked me down a few times. You've talked me down. Uh, I got your back. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, well, uh, speaking of getting my back, Hook me up, man, because I really, it's been a long time since I've heard you spit, since I heard you do your wow. thing. Uh, do you mind doing a poem for us, just to kick just, us off? Just this one time, I'll do a poem. All right, thank you, sir. <laughs> okay, this poem is titled, The Last Cookie. <clears throat> There's a creature in my room in a green, slimy cave. It's got fangs, smells like pee-pee, and is known to misbehave. Now this creature did something so evil and so mean that I will never ever forgive the creature. Not even in my dreams. It broke the one kid rule known only to kids. And if you've ever lived with a creature, you know exactly what it is. My mom baked 17 cookies with semi-sweet double chocolate chips. They smelled nutritious, tasted delicious. And when they touch my lips, I have to have another, and another, and another, and I would have eaten them all if it wasn't for my brother, the creature. My mom went crazy on us saying, you guys are out of control. You begged me to bake them, and you begged to lick the bowl. Now who ate 16 cookies? I've had just about enough of it. This last one is mine, and you better not touch it. The last cookie, it sat on the plate for three days straight. I go to school, come home, play Xbox, and wait 
and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait until the fourth day I just couldn't take it anymore. Mom, the dog knocked the plate and ate the cookie on the floor. I'm not lying. Uh, 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 I'm not lying. That's my brother. He was there. There's the proof. And do you know what this disloyal creature told her? The truth. <laughs> he broke the one kid. It's not funny. He broke the one kid rule. <laughs> Never ever tattletale. Three weeks of punishment, Gil. <laughs> Video game jail. No call of duty. Mortal Kombat, Tekken, Minecrafting, GTA, Injustice. It's still not funny, Gil. Stop laughing. <laughs> I told my mama, I told my mom I knocked the plate and ate the cookie on the floor. And I told my brother, look at me. I'm not your friend anymore. <laughs> he cried like a baby. And for that, I have regrets. But would I eat the last double chocolate chip cookie again? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Ah, uh, I love how you laugh at your own uh, greediness. In <laughs> you, I know you performed that poem a few times, but you can't help yourself but laugh. And I and I've heard it the the time you just did it before. And I just couldn't help but laugh, man. You're, <laughs> you're hilarious, dude. Um, so it, it, I got to ask you this. I got to ask you this. Uh, can you do your, your mom voice again? What does your mom sound like? Oh, forget you, Gil. <laughs> <laughs> she sounds like the mom in uh, the <laughs> Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Exactly. Like mommy and Auntie and Aunt Bel -Air. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. When I first started writing, I wrote, um, I was just attracted to, like, children's stories and rhymes and stuff like that and i wrote a billion of them mm -hmm. and um it just it just i have that like it's kind of like a dr Seussian kind of mm. uh um what was that tv show with that kid that got in trouble all the time the black and white one in the 50s dennis the menace dennis the menace it was kind of like a dennis the menace thing kind of thing mm. so i've always been attracted to that kind of situation where and i never had a brother mm. i'm the only child who knew uh. But um, that's what she told me. But yeah, so, so yeah, yeah. Did you, did you, now I noticed you do, you you rhyme a lot in your poems and it is kind of Dr. Seussian, but actually you touch on a lot of deep things. Not Maybe not in this one, this is about the cookie, but uh, but in other poems and a lot of other poems I heard you do, uh, you, you touch on some really deep social issues but you do it in a way that's accessible with with the rhyme. Is that always on purpose? Well, with the rhyme and humor, yeah, it's it's um it's a way to make it more palatable because if you just come straight out with the uh, point you're trying to make, you know, it kind of turns people off. It's the artistry is in in um, putting icing on the cake, mm. and, and by the time they realize that the cake is is uh, semi sweet as opposed to all sweet, they don't mind because of how you did it, how you baked it. And is that the type of, I know that's the type of poetry you do, but is that also the type of poetry that you're usually attracted to when you go to a poetry event? Or is it all kinds? Yeah, well, I mean, no, I mean, I like all types of poetry, but I was drawn to the, 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 the theme of saying something while something else is going on. Mm. Like, I, you know, you mentioned the Thundercats poem earlier, you know, mm. one thing is happening and then you're really thinking about I'm thinking about what's really happening. The metaphor of, you know, using the, the, the toys to talk about my stepfather, you know what I mean? So you could get caught up in one and then when the other hits you, it's just like, oh, it makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I mean, that's part of the job of a poet is to bring two things that don't seem like they fit together and, and put them together in these unique ways. Right. Uh, speaking of poets, we have some poets from last week turn in so every week uh, for those of you who are just tuning in it's your first time here at the poetry again welcome to the family uh sit under the shade chill out with us uh we have poems every week uh, we have a uh, an assignment every week uh, so the poet of the week gives a poetry prompt and people write in to me uh, and we read the ones that we really like the following week so we have three poems for you today and I'm going to have our guest read the first one. Are you ready, Paul? 
I am ready. All right. All right. This, this poem is titled The Pomegranate of Majorana. My skin is bitter. I know why. Exiled. Do you really think you can keep me away forever? Eternally trapped here, my skin has become as bitter as the peel of a pomegranate. Unbeknownst to you, 613 seeds of my inner being have turned into ruby red facets of rebirth. Mark my words, on the day of my release, I will plant an orchard from these seeds. The harvest will give me ability to forever renew myself. The wrath of my separation will be felt. You will kneel before me when I return. Mm. Mm. Dig that. And that was from? That was from Marjorie Pizzoli. Yeah. What did you appreciate about that poem? Personally, the uh, like we were just talking about, the change. There was a shift in in uh, in the tone. At first, it was it was okay. It was like okay, all right. But then it was like really some life changing stuff going on in yeah. terms of um, uh, mark my words on the day of my release. You know, that's what we want to do in life. We want to say what we mean and mean what we say and do what we say we're gonna do. Yeah. You know, and if you put that down, if you put it down and write, you. You better be powerful. <laughs> I love I love the line. Uh, Six hundred and thirteen seeds of my inner being have turned into ruby red facets of my rebirth. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, the alliteration of that was great. But the other thing that I really dig about it is so the assignment for those of you who uh, didn't catch last week, the assignment was to take a uh, take an emotion and and describe it th through a piece of fruit, uh, like a as if it, you were a part of that fruit or just. It, as a piece of fruit and the uh she used the pomegranate and mm -hmm. i would never consider think of pomegranate as something as life-giving or a rebirth and so to put that together uh, it was excellent uh okay my turn my turn my turn uh the next one is melancholy by leslie hodge bring the long knife sharp wooden handle that shakes hands with your hand Beige skin over orange flesh, harvest moon, sun in a smoky sky, taste bitter under sweet, soft in your mouth, sharp sense of defeat and disappointment. Yeah, I like that. So uh, what I really dig about that one, put your uh, emojis up for the last two poems, your emojis up, your snaps, whatever it is that you have going on. Uh, what I really like that one is just fun to read actually the way that she, she used words is just like these images. Um, but just comparing that orange to the harvest moon, to the sun over a smoky sky, the imagery was was excellent. Uh, do you want to do the last one, Paul? Yeah, sure, why not? Uh, this is Untitled by Nolan Lai, or Lay. If happiness was a vine of grapes, I would pluck every last ball of bliss only to juice the flavorless moments up only to sweeten the sour moments even when the thorns grow the vine grows faster mm, i like that i'm thirsty uh, what you appreciate about that one uh well, <laughs> like i just said i'm thirsty <laughs> <laughs> all right um i it's uh Fuck every last ball of bliss. It's yeah, it, it's it just makes me really get into grapes. <laughs> <laughs> the wait, wait, so the last line is even when the thorns grow, the vines grow faster. Okay, so the few okay, only the juice to flavorless moments up and sweeten our sour moments. Okay. Oh, okay. So in other words, take the good with the bad. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So even even when bad times grow, then the good the happiness, because he That's says right. the cap Happiness is a vine of grapes, so no, the vines true. grow faster. Because you do get a bad grape every now and then. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no. Definitely. Or a bad friend, you know, uh, that, no, I was going to make a bad ah. Okay. All right. So uh, <laughs> I have some questions for you. And those of you, oh, wait, uh, before that, give it up for all the poets that participated in this week's uh, challenge. 
My goal, if you follow us in the 10 weeks, and these live on the interwebs forever, so you can go back to, to the end of the show or watch the whole show, hopefully, uh, and listen to what the prompt was for each week. But my goal is by the end of the 10 weeks, uh, this, this programming, then you'll have 10 new poems you never had. And you'll have 10 lines of openings uh, of poems when we do the Under Pressure. And we're going to do that in a little bit. It's a little game that we're going to play. Uh, you down to play that, Paul? I'm ready to do this, man. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Uh, but besides that, I want you to be thinking of, of questions for Paul Maybond to put into the chat when I open it up for questions. Now, you can ask him, uh, are you an open book, Paul, pretty much? Legally? <laughs> oh, yes, 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 I'm open book. <laughs> so you can ask him about poetry. I know there's a lot of actors in the house. Uh, so you can ask them, ask him about acting. He's worked with some of the biggest names in, in Hollywood. He is consistently on the progressive commercial. When you see uh, the next progressive commercial, if there's ever a black guy in it, that's him. Uh, he's been in Walmart commercials. He's been in, I've seen him on so many commercials throughout. I'm at uh, Ralph's, I'm yeah. at Vons, I'm at yeah. Walmart, Target. Yeah. You can see me everywhere, I'm telling you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it, not, it wasn't T-Mobile, it was... Uh, um, uh, uh, what? So many. It, it was the other carrier, Sprint. Sprint. Never yeah. did it. Oh, you never did it? I thought you did. No. Nah, okay, that's... never mind. Anyway, I'm just bragging on my friend. So I'm so <laughs> proud of him. Uh, and when I see him in a movie or a TV show, so excited. So you can ask him about acting uh, or just uh, whatever you need. But I have a few questions for you uh, in the beginning. All right. So, my buddy. Uh, I always ask this to, to the poets because I think it's important. How would you describe your style to someone who has never heard you perform or spit before? Uh, theatrical, interactive, and um, true to life. Mm. And, and how Funny. do you, Funny. what'd you say? Funny. Funny. Maybe comical. Okay, all right, all right. Uh, what tool do you use when you're you're reading or, or you're performing to an audience to connect with them? Like, so there may be some people who have only written in their in their book and they haven't really performed yet. What tools do you use to to really connect with the crowd? Well, my uh, theatricality, uh, breaking the fourth wall, you kind of want to strive towards making it seem like you're having a conversation, as opposed to using your poetic voice, you know, um, when I used to teach poetry, it's, it's basically just trusting your voice oh. and knowing that you don't have to actually sound like a poet and your style will come from that. So along with using my voice, I found that being interactive was most beneficial to my style in that it complimented me being an actor. So yeah. if I ask you a question or if I say, that's not funny, yeah. or if I use your name, you know, it kind of makes you inside my poem. It makes you a part of it and you feel like you're a part of it, which, which um, it puts a lot of pressure on the audience. But at the same time, you know, it's good pressure in that you develop that relationship of trust. You trust me not to embarrass you or anything like that. Right. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> What's something that you wish that you knew when you were uh, just starting poetry? Um, but I wish that I knew. Well, yeah, yeah, just to just to believe in my my style. Um, I'm not very conventional in terms of your spoken word or your slam uh, type of poet uh, because I'm more performance oriented. Um, I, 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 my style was not as, I don't want to say accepted, but it definitely wasn't as normalized as my contemporaries. So mm -hmm. I got a lot of, what are you doing? Is that a skit? Huh. What is that? You know, and instead of, instead of uh, being, I guess, dissuade from being myself, I wish I could have learned to embrace it more because, you know, the only one that has to do it is me. And if I can't be happy with me, then what did RuPaul say? What did he say? If you don't love you, oh, shoot, what did he say, Gil? 
I don't know. How in the hell are you going to love somebody else? What did he say? He ends uh, his show. If, if you don't love yourself, how are you going to love someone else? Basically. I knew you watched it. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> Just context clues. Um, hey, what was it that, that brought you over that hump? Because I think a lot of people, when you first start out, you hear all these poet poems uh, and and poets that you really love and admire, and you you consciously and subconsciously you start to imitate that style. I know that like when I first heard Saul Williams, then you know a lot of people said started telling me I sounded like him. Uh, but what was it that that really made you embrace your style? Was it someone telling you something? Was it you know an event that happened? Can you pinpoint that? Well, when I was younger, I used to enter a lot of contests with a lot of poets and I would, I would win. Huh. And, you know, as different as my style was, um, I was constantly being validated for it. But when I moved out here, it was a whole different ball game in that everyone was just so, so talented. And then there was the influence of slam that my style was kind of like um, on an island and I kind of remembered that uh, there was a poet, Reggie Gaines, yeah. who was on TV. He was on Arsenio Hall, I'll never forget it. And he was doing this poem about Air Jordans and, and he was telling a story. And I was like, oh my God, that's what I wanna do. So, so it kind of validated me into believing that my style was just as, uh, just as valid as, as anyone else's. So regardless of that, I, I, constant, I focused on the fact that I believed in myself and then more awards and more TV shows came. So yeah, yeah. definitely. Poetry shows, yeah. So what advice would you give to someone who is trying to find their own voice and they may not be like as interactive or as funny or as outgoing as you are? Stop writing. No. Um, <laughs> that's what this comedian told me. I thought I wanted to be a comedian. I went to the Laugh Factory and I pulled them aside and I said, hey, man, I was thinking about doing it, man. Any tips? What do you think I should do? He said, it's too late. <laughs> and I was like, but you know what? When he said it's too late, I was so mad at him that um, I kept going. You know, and I didn't, I didn't necessarily go into the comedy, but it inspired me more to hear somebody that I admired say, you can't do that, you mm -hmm. know? And I was like, oh man, well, if you don't believe me, then I don't need you, you yeah. know? So you have to believe in yourself. Yeah. You have to believe in yourself. Sometimes your friends don't answer the phone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so is, so, but, you know, you said believe in yourself. Have you in working because you worked with a lot of teenagers trying to find their voice and that and, and, and with teenagers, that's a pivotal time of you're just trying to find yourself as well as your voice. What are some of the practical things that you might have uh, shown them or told them or suggested to them to help them find their voice? Do you remember any of those? Well, yeah, Do I remember. Any? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's 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 the constant because um, that's the age where you just want to fit in. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And you want to do what everybody else is doing so you feel accepted, you know, especially if you're in a collective or you're teaching a group of kids, you just want to belong. It's just like high school all over again. Right. But, you know, whenever they would read something and sound like someone else, if you can imitate it, my, my thing is that if you can imitate it, then it's not you, you know? So I would, they would say a line and then I would say it just like them in that poetic voice. Yeah. And everybody would develop the same ear and you can hear when somebody's not using their own voice. You know, you can hear it. So it's could like- you, Can you give us an example of the poetic voice? Like you have that book in front of you, right? Um, just pick uh, a random poem. I'll pick or a you could just do it, you could, you could just do it off the, off the top. Um, you know the poetic voice. I can't do it if I do well, it. I I know the poetic voice. Do the voice, Gil. No, 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 no. But you're the do actor. The you're the actor. You, you can do it. Like, okay, so I'm the director. And, right. and I said, uh, Paul, Paul, we're going to need okay. you to be a little bit more urban. Uh, and uh, you know what? I'm going to use the poem. I'm going to use the poem we just read and use the, and use the voice. Okay. The voice. Mm. All right, here we go. Poetic voice. 
Here it is. Okay. You don't have to do the whole poem, just like, you know, just. Yeah, like, here we go. Okay. My skin is bitter. I know why. Exiled, do you really think you can keep me away forever? Eternally trapped here, my skin has become as bitter as the peel of a pomegranate. So you see that sing song? Yeah. Kinda, yeah. yeah. But we love you, uh, 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 Marjorie. You what? don't sound like that. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't even heard her. She, she could have been rapping the whole time. Leave me alone, Gil. Uh, so what do you, what do you feel are some of the misconceptions about spoken word? You know, some, a lot of times I'll go into like a, a corporation or a boardroom that I've been commissioned for, and they still have no idea what spoken word is. What are some of the misconceptions that you've heard or seen? Well, just that, that it's all about, you know, sounding like the beatnik area of the sixties and snapping and tree mm. falling and bongos playing, you know, it's, it's a huge stereotype that is um that has yet to go away <laughs> but you know the beauty of having a new audience is that you get to win them over so yeah, yeah. what was the what was one of the the hardest times where you had to win over an audience let me let me let me break this down uh one of the hardest times you have to win over an audience uh in poetry and then another one where you have to win them over in acting, like in an audition or whatever. Well, in poetry, it was definitely my experience, you know, slamming because my style was so different that the question was, is that even a slam poem? So um, I remember feeling the pressure of letting down my team because they were like, oh, no, you know, to a certain extent, I'm not doing what everybody else is doing. And it made it, it made me feel like I was being egotistical when I was just kind of being me. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of actors try to do poetry and they sound like actors trying to do poetry, but I kind of started a lot younger. So I'm, even though I'm a little bit more on the actor tilt, I'm still poetic enough to just scoot by. But right. the, um, that was the poetic side. And what was the, you, the question in terms of acting? What'd you say it was? Yeah, what was one of the moments where you had to really try to win over the crowd uh, as an actor, where you felt in the beginning you weren't hitting them quite right, and then you did something to, oh, to okay. win them over? Well, that was, um, <laughs> okay, one of them was, um, there was this progressive commercial that I did where we're on this Zoom call and it's a lot of improv going on, right? And I'm traditionally, I do a little improv in my, in my poems. So I'm working with improv people that have gone to Groundlings, you know, and they're like legends and stuff. And we're doing this thing and they would yell cut. And cause it's, well, I would think they would yell cut because the end of the script, the lines were done, but they would keep going. And I would check the script and like, is there more lines or, you know, so. My background wasn't as traditional as theirs, but I was a little intimidated by the whole process, but they kept telling me that I was, I was funny and I was doing the work, but I didn't understand it. But there was this one commercial where uh, the guy that plays Jamie was, was rapping, right? He goes, hey, my name is Jamie. It's this Zoom call thing. And then I just said, Jamie, don't do that. And then everybody busted up laughing. <laughs> And then that's when I finally said, okay, I think I got it. <laughs> you know, I'm on to something. So, you know, that's when um, I just realized that I really, really had to kind of be okay with my voice, even though it was different from theirs, it was still just as valid and could have the same effect if I just believed in myself, said, said, wow. my, said my voice. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you one more question. And okay. then uh, we had already some, a few questions come in through the oh, chat. Yeah. yeah, and then we'll go into uh, under pressure and we have some, we'll, hopefully we'll have some more questions coming in from the chat. So again, if you have any questions for Paul Maybon about anything, go ahead and, and type it out now. Um, but before we get to that, my question to you are is, what are your top five rules slash tools that you use in creating poems? Okay. 
Number one, if someone asks you to go to a Jay-Z concert in San Diego, show up an hour early. No. <laughs> hey, hey, that was not, it was my fault. I'm sorry. I drove all the way to San Diego for a Jay-Z concert, and we were two hours late. <laughs> I thought it started later. It was oh a rap concert. It's supposed to start later and be late even at <laughs> the time that it starts. That's um, okay. It was him. <laughs> All right, top five. five. Five rules. Uh, number one, just say it. Oftentimes, we don't say what happens in our poems because we're trying to be poetic. We use metaphors and flowery language. If you, but if you just say what's going on, That'll lead you closer to uh, the light, mm. your message. Oftentimes, if you read somebody a poem and they go, oh, that was cool. What was it about? And then you explain what it's about. And then at the end of your explanation, they go, well, why didn't you just say that? That was more poetic than what you just said. You know, right. that happened to me a billion times. Mm. Number two, don't overthink. Whatever comes out, just finish the thought. Amen. There's been a billion poems that I've never even started because I was trying to figure out the best way to start it. Right. Number three, don't write for other people. Write for yourself. Mm -hmm. A lot of people get caught up in the, ooh, wait till I read this at this event. Um, if I say it like this, I'm going to get a bigger reaction from the crowd and blah, blah, blah. Some poems are just for you. You know, some poems are just meant for cathartic purposes. In other words, to help you get through whatever you're going through. Right. Number four, leave it alone for a day. Then come back at it. Mm -hmm. You know how you obsess over poems, right? Yeah. But if you forget about it, then you come back to it and you got that fresh look like, oh, wow. Well, that line's horrible, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> we good. You know? So yeah, make yourself leave it after you get the initial hit out, just leave it alone for a while, then come back. Mm. See if it stands the test of time. Right. And last but not least, last but not least, last but not least. Yes. Um, be inspired. And this is just a suggestion. I write from inspiration. I wait for stuff to happen to me that inspires me. It may be a quote, it may be a funny saying. A lot of my poems just come from something that I think of and I put on Facebook and then a lot of people comment on it, mm. you know? Like for one poem, I said, Dear Sally, our interracial entanglement is finally over. <laughs> Stop calling my relatives. <laughs> Paul. <laughs> and you wrote a whole poem off of that. And I wrote a whole, well, yeah, I did. It was like um, about my student loans. So there you go. Oh, that had nothing to do with Sally. Is it about? Oh, I get it, Sally May. Oh my God! <laughs> You're I'm sorry, you didn't do the poem. You just said Sally, and like that was it. Well, that was the quote that led to the poem. You know what, man? I feel like I got that pretty quick because that was very vague. And uh, maybe some of the people out here in the interwebs, you got it a little quicker than me. I'm sorry. I'm juggling three things, trying to look at the questions uh, that are coming up in the chat, but and listen to you. But yeah, I got it. <laughs> All right. Dope, dope. All right. So let me ask, uh, here's uh, one question from Teresa. She says, hi, how is your vision for the end things? Maybe like, uh, what is your vision to, to, to end a poem? Like, how do you know when a poem is done? I'm thinking. Well, saying. for me, the end is usually the beginning. I like to bring, thing, bring things full circle. Right. So like for that cookie poem that I read, um, it started out with me and my brother and it ended with me and my brother. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if ever you struggle for the ending, just look for what you said in the beginning. My approach is kind of like a research paper. You know, at the very beginning, you, you say what you want to say, you say it, and then you circle back and say it again. You know, it's like a mini research paper. Right. All right. Cool. Um, okay, so you ready to play? Let's let's just play this game. Okay. Uh, so, it, ladies and gentlemen, if you see me looking down, is because I have someone. Because uh, it's hard to keep track of all the questions and everything. Uh, I'm. This person is communicating, showing me all your questions, so that I can ask Paul. All right. But 
right now we're going to play my favorite game. It's called Under Pressure. And what Under Under Pressure is, is you're going to write one line of poetry in two minutes. That's basically it. One, and everybody listening, uh, all the people watching on YouTube, Facebook, wherever, get out a pen and paper. I'm giving you time now. Get out your phone, whatever it is. And you're about to write just one line of poetry. This is going to be like your opening line of poetry, okay? So something that really grabs people. Forever. And we're going to pick two subjects. So I have in my little hands, hot little hands, uh, a list of common sayings, okay? Like a dime a dozen or cut to the chase or curiosity killed the cat. And then I also have a list of, if I can find it, here we go of literary themes like the heartbreak of betrayal or necessity of work or the oppression of women. So I have them all numbered one through 75. Paul is going to give me two numbers between the uh, one and 75. We're going to pick a common saying and match it with a theme and, and see what we got here. uh, Paul and I are both going to do it. And then you at home, I want you to do it too. Join along with us. Let's get poetic. Maybe you find your next masterpiece. You never know. All right, here we go. So, Paul, give me uh, your first number between 1 and 75. 24. 24. Yes. 24 is on the ropes. On the ropes. On the ropes. Yes. Okay. And then I'm writing that down for myself on the ropes. And then the next number. I'm going to hit you with a strong 22. I'm going to go reverse. 22. Uh, Growing up, pain or pleasure? So on the ropes and then growing up. And you can mix and match this however you want. You can uh, can do whatever you want to these, okay? There's no real rule on that. Just there has to be an element from each side. Okay, so growing up uh, on the ropes, uh, and then the the subtext is um, pain or pleasure, and you're mixing that, sorry, on the ropes, and then you're mixing that with growing up pain or pleasure. And you're gonna have two minutes to do it. Ready? You ready, Kevin? Let's go, let's get it. Two minutes starting now. All right, you ready, man?
You ready, brother? Oh, you're on mute. No, I'm not. I'm just playing. Oh. <laughs> Got you, Kevin. <laughs> all right. Uh, I didn't get it. I couldn't get it all in. I have more th in my thoughts, but I'm going to let you go. Okay. This is what I wrote down. Growing up on the ropes, sweet scientists find pleasure in the pain. Box me in Hollywood, American made in the hood. Mm, I like that. I like that. Uh, okay, my turn. Life often has me on the ropes, growing into the right hook coming at me. The trick is learning to duck the left. Mm. That's it. That's wow. it. All right, let's see what we got uh, from our studio audience. Mine is way better than yours. <laughs> <laughs> oh, was that lit? You can hear that? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, only you can get away with that. <laughs> only you can be get away with that. <laughs> see if we have any. Oh, yeah, we have some right here. Uh, here we go. This is from Shelly. Uh, and Teresa said, can you write it in Spanish? And I said, y and I will say yes. And I just lost it in this thing. Okay. Hey, Shelly, you got it? We, we, we twirl, spin, turn, you run and jump, just step on the rope and uh, just step on the rope, you'll fall down. There you go. My, my uh, comments in my, on my iPad, they keep disappearing. So I'm, uh, here we go. We got some coming from, um, there we go. Do you, do you see one that you want to read? Yeah, Leo Francisco, 14, and it hit me, hit me hard. A heavyweight fist to my welter made heart. Mm. On the ropes from the start. Ooh, fell in love. All right, Leo. <laughs> cool. Uh, Lee, let me see. Who else? Who else? Who else? Um, I think that's that's it for right now. But we do have some- oh, Wait a minute, Erica Phillips. Okay. Go for it. No, go ahead. You got it, because I can't see it. It's okay. coming fast and furious. Erica Phillips, on the ropes, upside down in the playground. I'm the freest in the park. Tricks, flips, pulling, climbing, applause from strangers. Before I learned, I could fall. Woo! Woo! There you go. All right, here we go. Uh, this is from Daniel. Uh, it says, uh, Daniel Tijuana Gringo. That's the name. Uh, we climbed the mountain chasing sunset every night until till cops found the pusher's body tossed out on, on cement path. Hmm. We climbed the mountain chasing sunset every night until cops found the pusher's body tossed out on cement path. I don't know if that was on the ropes, but maybe you guys heard something. It's about growing up. It or is about growing up. Maybe we should call the police. <laughs> I have another one, Christopher R. Uh, I was growing up and falling down. I was almost out on the ropes, double cross, but never giving up. There you go. And then, oh, Erica Phillips, okay. This is a good friend of mine, Erica Phillips, another teaching artist at the Old Globe. On the ropes, upside down in the playground, I'm the freest in the park. Tricks, flips, pulling, climbing, applause from strangers before I learned I could fall. Oh, that was one of my favorites so far. Really? Because I, like <laughs> I, I like that better than yours. It's probably because you just heard me read it a minute ago, Gil. <laughs> <laughs> you just read that? I literally just read that a minute ago. Oh, I was looking at the I was looking at uh, the other ones. Uh -huh. Great job, everybody! <laughs> hey, uh, did you did you read uh, Leslie Hodges though? Did you read Leslie Hodges? Did huh? I read Leslie Hodges? What about though? that? What about that? Uh, Leslie Hodges isn't up on my thingy yet. Well, I'm gonna read it. Floating like like the butterfly past the pain of the chrysalis. Mmm. Mm. Like it. Some some great writers out there. All right. So any other questions for Paul Maybon? Uh, and while you're thinking of the questions, 
please give it up for all the poets that have contributed a line. You know what? We should take, we should take all these and then put it into one poem. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. At the end of the show. Yeah. That'd yeah. be dope, right? That would be dope. We gotta, we gotta work it out with the producer and 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 the person uh, collecting all these. But that would be amazing. All right. So we have a question. Teresa is asking, what is poetry? Oh, uh, wait, let me see. Teresa is asking, what is poetry for you? Is it also a necessity? So what is poetry for you and is it a necessity? For me? Uh, wow. Poetry is self-exploration for me and it is a necessity. I thought that because I started stop teaching kids and started going more into acting that I was kind of done with poetry. But when you get inspired, you get inspired. And whether you share it or not, or whether I share it or not, I have to let it out. So it ain't going anywhere. And mm. I'm okay with that. Mm. So tell me about a time when you fell out of love with poetry. Because we all have those moments where we fall out of love with poetry. Um, Wow. Well, I mean, I just, I just stepped away for a while. Like I said, I just thought, I, I thought that I was like done because I was like doing all this acting stuff. And I was like, okay, this is going to be my new art. Mm -hmm. And you know, but it's just, I've been doing it for so long. It's just who I am, you know? Yeah. Um, it, it just comes out. I may not be able to post it or tell it to anyone, but I definitely have to say how I feel. So I'll never stop doing that. Mm -hmm. What do you look for in the editing process? Less is more. The less you say, you take out all of the, the filler words and you find ways to get straight to the point without losing that conversationalism. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the editing process, it has to bring everything full circle. It has to make it make sense from beginning to end. You have to dig yourself in a hole and then find the beautiful way to dig yourself out. Mm. Yeah. So is the connection the same to the audience for you when like doing it in a poetry event like uh, like a little quiet 20, 30 person versus doing it on TV, like HBO Def Jam and, and uh, Showtime at the Apollo, stuff like that? When you're on a national stage well i mean i haven't done that in a in a while but it's the bigger the the bigger the stage you you lose a little bit more of your intimacy and your interactiveness mm -hmm. but at the same time if it's too few people they'll get freaked out because you know it's very intimidating for somebody to just talk to you and not speak until you answer the question in the poem mm -hmm. but um but um yeah it's it's, a, it's pluses and minus to both of them Okay. Yeah. Now, how do you feel about the competition of poetry? Then when you first started versus now? Well, when I first started, um, everybody has their generations. Like you and I, we were in the generation of our time where we drove all up and down the coast to go to slams and Big Sur and yeah. at the Poetry Lounge and San Diego and Elevated. So it just it just kind of finds its new generations. You know, I, I, I think that, you know, you never want to say, well, I'm not going to do that anymore. But it's kind of like high school or college when everybody graduates mm -hmm. and you could stay another year, <laughs> but you're the oldest one in the class. So. <laughs> So, but but there's there's poets of of all ages still doing slams, right? No. <laughs> well, no. I mean, it's <laughs> no. I mean, it's it's all hate mail should go to. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I I feel like I feel like you should be able to pass it on and create new opportunities for the next generation. Mm. Like what I'm focused on now, even though I still write, I like producing events that that showcase younger newer talent mm -hmm. because you know as bad as i want to be on stage and enter a slam and whatever i feel like i think i've said everything i need to to my generation mm -hmm. that 
they want to hear. Mm. And even though I still may do some things every now and then as far as performing or posting a poem, um, it's important for the youth to be heard because that's how that's how the message gets taught. That's how it keeps going. You do you to- feel do you feel that those things are mutually exclusive though? Could you uh, still be performing and, and doing like competitions, uh, but still like big up the youth and, and bring them along? Well, well, the competitions are a way to get the audiences involved. Like any kind of competitive, like sports, you know, we come for the competition. If there was no score, what's the point mm. of the game, right? So it's it's kind of it's kind of ironic that there's a score in poetry because it's such a self-expressive art. Right. How are you going to judge people on being themselves? You know, right. you don't even know them. Right. You don't know if they're being their authentic self or not. Right. But the slam, the competition part allows you to kind of do that, you know, in a egotistical kind of way. You're better than him. And she's better than her. You know, it's, it's all relative. It's, it's like, it's just an excuse to have, have fun. Most of the popular poets, the very talented people, but it just depends on the arbitrariness of the audience. Yeah. Um, what touches you may not touch me. Right. I don't care how many slams you won. Right. I don't like your coat. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right. I don't like that hat on your head. You know? <laughs> where, where would you like to see uh, poetry go that it hasn't really gone to before? Um, well, I, 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 I mean, I, I love any kind of shows that pay homage to like spoken word. Like I believe Insecure had a spoken word episode and yeah, she was on stage, but, uh, they kicked her off real quick. There yeah. was a, uh, cause she was doing it in that poetic voice. Oh, is that what it was? Yeah. yeah there's a girl up there and, and she was doing it in, in the, but I mean, it's a comedy, so. Yeah. But I mean, but anything that brings attention to it. Mm-hmm. Is 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 keeping it in the mainstream. I was very fortunate to be part of that that deaf poetry era. I came in at the, I think I came in at the very kind of the end of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was a magical time, and the reason why it was magical was because I was, you know, I was a lot younger. Yeah. And I think that if there was a lot more events like that uh, nationally televised, so that um, other kids can be inspired to, to, to not just be on stage and perform, but to just say how they feel and relate to other kids. You know, that's very, very important. Uh, I can't tell you how many times people come up to me and they say, oh, are you the toothbrush guy? And I'm like, yeah. that was a long time. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's like, man, this kid is slamming and talking about something that I did when he was like seven, 12, it's crazy, Great. it's crazy. When did you start dying your hair? <laughs> Whatever. Uh, so I'm gonna have you do your, your, your final poem, but before we do that, can you give everybody their, their homework for next week? So this is the prompt that you're going to be writing on for this week. Uh, and you send it in to gso2 at the old globe.org. That's gso2 at the old globe.org. Uh, the, the parameters of it is going to be one minute or less. You can videotape yourself doing it, and we'll play the videotape if you get it to me early enough. Uh, I say videotape, that's how old I am. That that's, tells you how old. You can record yourself uh, performing the poem, or you can just write it and we'll have whoever the poet for next week who is going to be bridget gray who's an amazing oh bridget yeah bridget gray oh man we're gonna have bridget gray and then after bridget gray we're gonna have buddy wakefield what yeah oh wow this is gonna be great so we're 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 doing it uh i'm trying to get like the biggest and best poets that i can yeah man you haven't pissed everybody off that's great (laughs) <laughs> I, I love this art form so much and I want to share it with the world. So well, what's your what's your poetry prompt? And I and I tasked I tasked Paul to give me something that goes along with his style. Okay. Okay, what is it? All right. Um 
from the moment you awake, tell me about the best day of your imaginary life. Mm. So write a poem about the best day of your imaginary life. Right. Okay. Woke up and Prince was playing Purple Rain and <laughs> Betty Crocker made me some eggs. I don't know what you do. Okay, all right. Your imagination. You want Prince, uh, okay, waking you up, that'd be oh, beautiful. Imaginary life, yes. Imaginary life. The best day of your imaginary life. All right, blessings. Cool, so you got that? One minute, the best day of your imaginary life. Send it to gsotu at theoldglobe.org and I can't wait to read them. It's one of my highlights of, of my week, I'm telling you guys. So, without any further ado, Mr. Paul Maybon, it's the last right. poem. This poem is titled, You Know, The Beach Cruiser. The first time I learned to ride, someone ran behind me holding my seat for balance. Are you still there? I grew up turning to look back, then falling. Hard to resist fear. There's something wrong with everybody. I ain't saying what else is wrong with me. I'm under an imaginary contract to be nice. <laughs> Curbing my enthusiasm for a fulfilled life was never an option. I'm way too passionate, AKA extra for that. Heavy with all this mortality of loved ones, I wonder if this all ends in love. Hmm. Like I said, it's hard to resist. Some mornings, I cruise past million dollar homes along Manhattan Beach, inspired, excited, like the first time I realized there was no one running behind me. Hey, beautiful, beautiful. I, and I like how you have, <laughs> I like how you cheered yourself on, but I, I love how you have just all these different sides of you uh, to where you can, you can get deep with a poem or you can be really silly uh, and still be effective with both. Man, I gotta tell you, dude, it, it has been such a pleasure having you on. Um, I'm always nervous whenever I bring you on to a show or whatever, because I never know what you're gonna say. Oh, come on, don't be like that. <laughs> in a I good way. Never... In a good way. In a good what way. One time and the bell was not that much. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, ladies and gentlemen, if you ever go out to, to lunch or dinner with Paul, you never know what he's gonna say to whoever's that, serving you. That like, not... that, that's a whole other thing. Oh, you know, come so, on. I'm never I... gonna get a date, Gil. <laughs> I thought be... I was funny, and then I always end up playing his straight man. And he just goes off and, and does his thing. Uh, and I just pray that people don't spit in my food. All right. I hope you have three more children. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Oh. Fertile, Mr. Fertile Ground over there. <laughs> what a thing to wish for somebody. I wish you had three more children. Hope you have three more children. In a, in a good, bad way. Like, that's beautiful and messed up at the same time. Man, all right, all right, all right. I hope, right. hope you're an artist forever. <laughs> I love you, too. I love you, too. Yeah. I'm going to end it like that, because I'm all about peace and love. <laughs> and gentlemen, that is our show. I hope you had a good time. Give it up for Mr. Paul Maybon. Uh, check, his, check his IMDB. You can just uh, put it in. In Paul Maybon, you'll see the list of credits that he's been in. Check the progressive commercials when you see him in there. Clap for him. Also, go on his Instagram, Facebook, and just support this brother because he's putting in work, and I'm oh, yeah. also my, proud of him. My Instagram is P Maybon. P Maybon. P M A B O N. There you go. Uh, until next week, see you guys later. <laughs>